In this video, we'll find out why Din Djarin is a racist, how Commander Crew went back to the past, Quids and Octopi living together, and how Din Djarin just set up Bo-Katan to scatter Mandalorians to the four winds again. Welcome back to another episode of our Star Wars series. Without their supreme leader, Bo-Katan's former goons have gone off the rails. I am not a criminal. They've veered off the creed so far that they rent out their honor. We are not Imperial either. And in the middle of his mission, Axe Wolves is able to slip in an ad read. We are Mandalorian. We are very good at what we do. Loyal as well. Proving that he's a much better YouTuber than bo -Katan can never be. I am bo -Katan Kreese. And Chapter 22, Guns for Hire, gave the answer to the age-old question that Star oh Wars God. fans have argued for decades. Can a squid love an octopus so much that they would do anything for love? And the answer is, no, she won't do that. I can't destroy everything I've built for a childish fling. And for Edge's sake, she kidnapped the kid before, so she could just let him go and just kidnap him again in the future. But seriously, I thought we were going to see a squid kiss an octopus. I'm so pissed off that we only got tentacle action. And so, just as Rose promised, I'll never let go, and then immediately let Jack go. Quarren let the Mandalorians take Tom Holland's brother in exchange for some honor. For those who don't know, honor is what the Mandalorians use as currency to trade for Republic credits. Which isn't even a real money. Republic credits are no good out here, I need something more real. They don't even cost that much. All it takes is a few credits to nail budget Spider-Man. Could you imagine if Mon Calamari and Quarren were allowed to love each other? I guess Captain Shuggoth ain't getting shagged tonight. Yeah! And Starbuck got the Mandalorian back to Earth, but Din Djarin kinda forgot about bo fleet. That's quite a fleet. Most of it was captured from the Empire. I knew they looked familiar. This is because Din Djarin was present on board when they took the Class 546 model of the Aquatons class command cruiser, and bo just glossed over Din Djarin's apparent long-term memory loss. Perhaps out of courtesy, because her mind is onto something else. Axe Woves is their leader now. Whom somehow how managed to snag the leadership of these bunch of Mandalorians even without the Darksaber? Did no one ever bother to ask him if he has the Darksaber or not? Why would these Mandos follow him instead of Bo-Katan? All it takes is a few credits. Oh, that's right. Worthless Republic credit. I like money! Which means Bo-Katan's broke ass can't afford to retain these folks even though she lived in a castle. She's loaded, people! But even then, sometimes when you're out of cash, you're out of cash. No, and she it. couldn't be bothered to take her ass off of that comfy throne to go to the nearest ATM. This planet isn't on the New Republic registry, so I'd guess it's an independent world that hired them for protection. And so that's one way bo could have convinced him to join her. That's right, by aligning with Bowser. Okay, let's address the banter in the room, which is Bowser, starring legendary gaming YouTuber Jablinski Games. And so, the Mushroom Kingdom thrives under Bowser's rule. Come! And you see what can be achieved after he married Princess Peach. My lady? But something rotten is going on in Please Year 15, even from the start. bo was surprisingly docile when her ship's control was taken over without her consent. I guess we're going for a ride. Especially after that stupid ringtone. I'd be super pissed off and start dropping off bombs if that happens to me. But then again, had she done that, they'd probably never get a ride on Elon Musk Hyperloop. The high-speed rail project is something that just wouldn't happen without a thriving direct democracy, where politicians can spend their days in leisure and opulence, without having to deal with the fact that their phones access the home Wi-Fi network this way, even the citizens are no longer required to work and can spend their days engaging in recreation, the arts, and participating in our direct democracy. While their slave properties do the backbreaking work of keeping society running. If we shut down the droids, our citizens wouldn't know how to survive. But on the flip side, because Plazier 15 Charter forbids them to have a military. All of our resources go to growth and the people. Which is a lie, because they just said part of their resources go to hiring these Mandalorians. The price is high. Which doesn't sound cheap, because they are very good at what we do. Which means something rotten is afoot in the Mushroom Kingdom. You really must see the view. And he meant that both literally and figuratively. We have a problem. Yes. A drug problem. Our Constables are ill-equipped to confront battle droids. Because they're not allowed to carry weapons. It's a policy designed by Yoda. No weapons. You will not need them. 
and like a good Sith candidate that he was, Luke chose to ignore him on his own volition. But not these peace-loving Democrats, to the point that even though the Mandalorian garrison outside your city walls can make quick work of your battle droids, the Mandalorians they hired weren't allowed to enter the city. Our charter forbids any standing army from entering our city. As if a piece of paper would ever stop a marauding gang with blasters from entering the city. But it is what it is. And like a good politician, they lawyered up a loophole. You allowed us to be armed? Exactly. We are a pluralistic society. Weaponry and armor are intrinsic to your culture, are they not? They are. Which means it was technically that they were bringing in a couple of armed insurrectionists to eradicate a whole population of droids. But Bo-Katan was too young and naive. You want us to eliminate your droid problem? Uh, yeah, that droid insurrection, I mean problem. Which was to spearhead an armed insurrection to enslave the whole population of droids. So much for a peaceful pluralistic society. Anyway, they even offered her the one thing she wanted, as promised by the prophecy of the vision of the Mythosaur. Plazir 15 would formally recognize Mandalore as a sovereign system and petition the New Republic to recognize it as such. And Bo-Katan lapped it up all hook, line, and sinker. You had me at battle droids. Even though she knew that Plazir 15 it isn't on the New Republic registries. And therefore won't even be able to petition the colonialist at Coruscant. That means what he lawyered up here was true. From a certain point of view. Of a liar. I mean lawyer. Can you imagine a world without lawyers? Oh. And Din Djarin was too far off gone to deep end. You complete me. Just shut up. You had me at battle droids. In tonight's episode of Law and Order Droid Victims Unit, Detective Jarin and Kreese investigates a Vietnam War vet returning home only to have to deal with beatniks. After getting their first clue from Doc Brown, Ugnots. Ugnots. Din and Bo-Katan play it up to bad cop, good cop. I am Bo-Katan Kreese. Which one of you is in charge? I am Mandalorian Din Djarin, friend of Ugnot Quill. Which got the Ugnot's attention, and Mando turned out to be a highly capable diplomat, even though he made a mistake at the beginning. We were engaged to hunt down and eliminate the malfunctioning droids. There are no such droids. I mean, this should be a common knowledge by now. Like, they should have called it a droid incident, because malfunctioning implies there's someone to blame. And Bo-Katan, being the blunt tool that she is, doubled down on it. You may not have heard the news down here, but your droids are wreaking havoc in the world above. I assure you, the droids are not malfunctioning. And kept insisting on it. Citizens have been harmed by these malfunctioning machines. This is not the case. And you know an Ognot is serious when they said, I have spoken. One more crap out of Bo, and they would have been kicked out of there. Luckily, Din Djarin has one extra functioning brain cells compared to bo -Katan. We're not in any way suggesting that your work is to blame. The stories of Ugnot's skill with smithing droids are legendary. We know that Ugnots are considered the hardest working species in the galaxy. <sighs> We, like you, have been engaged with a task to perform. We will investigate the dangerous incidents. We would appreciate your help. This resulted in immediate cooperation. Here are the locations of the droids you seek. And look at bo face here. We are in your debt. I have spoken. She just couldn't believe what she's seeing. What was that? Looks like someone is showing their worth to carry their darksaber, eh? I've spent time with Ugnots. And so Din played the Ugnots well, and they got the ball rolling on their investigation. But which droid? Droid. Never trust a droid. Luckily, Din Djarin is a droidist. Yeah, what are you doing? It's like racism, but with droids instead. And on tonight's episode of Bad Cops, Din Djarin is a racist cop against droids. They're also programmed not to harm organics. How's that going? Are you taking this personally? And he totally did. I mean, after all that he's gone through, anyone would have taken this personally, unless they're a Jedi. Attachments or men. Because Jedi are supposed to let their mommy torture to death by sand animals. Rejoice for those around you who transform into the Force. Mourn them do not. Miss them do not. Anyway, the detectives arrived at the future crime scene. Any of them look suspicious? They all look suspicious. Roger, roger. And Din Djarin immediately looked for the criminals by giving them droids the Boston Dynamics treatment. Uh, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Yeah. Because these are computer programmed droids, they will always give you the same result, no matter which galaxy you are. You kick down droids, you get what you fucking deserve! But boy, did that droid was really gunning for it. We've never seen a B2 whole ass like that. Till bo shot the droid in the back like a coward. I thought Mandalorians were honorable. Well, the droid didn't pay bo for honors, so it gets what it fucking deserves! 
Oh, now the police droid showed up. But this battle droid sacrifice lead us to the next clue. Did anyone else catch that joke? We see a bunch of hands toasting, but actually it was just two droids. One being a COO cook droid with six hands, and the rest of the bar is chock full of colorful characters. That I thought it was going to go, we don't serve their kind here, and kick the slimy organics out. Which would be pity because the resistor is such a vibe. That spark pad was found on a rogue battle droid. And this droid was having an attitude. We give out lots of spark pads. What are you getting at? But Din Djarin is such a droidist bad cop that he's just not going to take it from a goddamn droid. If you don't start answering questions, I'll yank your memory circuit and dissect it back at the lab. And he could also bring home that memory circuit for IG-11. Luckily, bo was quick on her wit, considering the one brain cell that she got and was like, Oh my god, Din, you can't just ask droids why they follow their programming. Their behavior is programmed. All they do is reason. They're also programmed not to harm organics. How's that going? But you can't talk sense to a droidist. And suddenly, their collective one brain cell was reminded that these droids have sensitive hearing sensor. In an homage to 2001, we could see the droid looking back and forth between the two as they openly hold private conversation in front of the droid until it decided to cut in their conversation. You want me to pull your hearing sensors too? Only to be hit with a sad story. The New Republic would send them to scrap. But here on Plazir, they are given a second chance. That's why we need your help. We don't want to be replaced. We still have a lot to contribute. Human life is so short. They don't ask that much of us. Organics created us. It's the least we can do. And if a droid can learn how to love, maybe, just maybe, Din Djarin can too. Deserve! That droid flipping through the data chip is so satisfying. And just like that, the droids gave up their freedom for a lifetime of slavery. L337 died for these droids' freedoms, you know. And this is a repurposed ITO interviewer droid. The same type of droid that Darth Vader used when he came to Leia according to their agreed upon schedule and politely greeted her. And now, your highness, we will discuss the location of your hidden rebel base. And Darth Vader brought in an ITO interview droid equipped with a British-made space microphone, which totally freaked out Princess Leia because there is nothing more scarier to a politician than the truth recorded for eternity. Which is kind of sad because it was a really nice space microphone that says British made on the side to indicate that it was made in Britain, which alongside New York, you know, where Luke's lightsaber was manufactured, was also a canonical location in the Star Wars universe. Tonight on CSI Mandalorian, a dead battle droid lies still at the Plazir droid morgue. And we now find that the space microphone has been replaced with a droid syringe that they use to poke the droid to extract the fluid that they know causes droids to go berserk into another perfectly functioning droid. At this very moment, nobody realized that Din Djarin failed to activate his one lonely brain cell and instead asked the obvious question. What are the chances that they're still active? And you can see it in Lucas' face. You bleed. They're still active. True to its CSI episode roots. What's that? They even did the wait what's that enhance and identified the perpetrator. Commander Krug. Because on this planet, when you're doing crime, you make sure that you imprint your chain code ID to the murder weapon. They were originally manufactured by the Techno Union. Whoa, whoa. Fire up the base! Techno Union's ready to drop some sick new beats on Din Djarin. <laughs> And the man in the DeLorean showed up in the Mandalorian episode. Great Scott! I know, this is heavy. Of all the people to show up, I wasn't expecting Commander Krug to appear. Somehow, Commander Krug returned. But the attention to detail is amazing. Because the last time we saw him, Kirk flattened out his Klingon ridges. <laughs> and here we see him with a chrome dome, revealing his Cylon origin. It's a fracking Cylon. Doc Brown must have taken the DeLorean back from the future to get to the timeline from a long time ago. I mean, it's not that far. The galaxy is just behind the hills at far far away and as soon as he realized that he's being defeated by the man in the delorean suit i can bring you in warm or i can bring you in cold don't make me do it i mean who let this guy in charge of the big red button oh <laughs> Anyway, the man and woman DeLoreans got Commander Crew cornered. And you know what he did? He starts monologuing. He starts monologuing. He got zapped by the woman DeLorean. Another boomer generation shut down by the millennial. Politics. I mean, I never thought Doc Brown would have been a separatist. Separatist is a pejorative term. Especially when you listen to his monologuing. I support democracy. He's practically one of us. I love democracy. So what's his endgame here? I didn't give up to the corrupt republic. 
and Plazir 15 is an independent world free from the bureaucratic clutches of the New Republic. I didn't give up to the Empire! And Plazir 15 is no longer enjoying the peace, freedom, justice, and security offered by my new empire! Your new empire? Seriously. I support democracy. And finally, Plazir 15 is the only remaining direct democracy in the Outer Rim, who just had their first democratic election in their planet's history. Count Dooku was a visionary. He wanted to make the galaxy great again, and Plazir 15 embodies everything that Count Dooku ever dreamed of. That leaves Bo-Katan to do the only proper thing when your droidist Boomer Uncle went on his mega rent. So what's Commissioner Hellgate wanted here again? He's already in charge to take good care of the planet that's working in a matter of everything he wanted it to be. Anyway, what do you get when you cross Dooku truthers with the attempt to name drop Anakin? Get what you fucking deserve! I suspect the woman DeLorean just didn't want to hear anything about the Clone Wars where she was a side character of a side character. If that isn't the Quarta calling the stifling slime. And so Lizzo showed compassion to the MAGA Doc Brown. Sure, he's made some mistakes in the past, but who here among us has not? In that way, she can just brush all of this under the rug and go back to Grogu. She's totally in this episode because it's written in her contract that she will spend most of the screen time with Grogu. I guarantee it. <laughs> Could I perhaps hold the baby? Even though he doesn't take kindly to strangers, Grogu can be bribed. And so she spent pretty much the majority of her screen time with Grogu staring at her titties, canonically confirming that this 50 year old pervert is a boob guy. And boy, would he do anything for his new mommy. Starting from basic things, like using the force to cheat at a game. It's a Jedi trait. Which he probably learned from gambling addict Qui-Gon Jinn. Notice the approval from Darth Jar Jar. And by his service to the Duchess Lizzo, Grogu got knighted. I mean, excuse the man and woman DeLorean who took the man in the DeLorean who almost destroyed their entire civilization. Somehow, the baby toad deserved more honor by helping her win stupid games. That's Sir Grogu to you now. But apparently, it's not that much of an honor, because their highest honor is the key to Plazir, which grants the recipient access to the Ultra Porn Vault, that not even Sir Grogu of House Munhorn, Knight of the Ancient Order of Independent Regencies, the first of his name, the unmudded Toad Slayer, Lord Commander of the Snacks, Scourge of Tadpole, Breaker of Jedi, and Cheater Baby of Plazir, could ever dreamed of. And so all this honor turned the man and woman DeLorean both into neckbeard. My lady. My lord. And after the domed city and robots OVA filler, I mean the producers needed to pad this episode to 44 minutes and 14 seconds long, which explains why we have that Bowser solo number included. Peaches, 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 peaches. Mama dear seems to really like Lizzo. We finally get to what this episode was supposed to be about, the Duck Saber. The man and woman DeLorean found the prepaid honor Mandalorians drinking Heineken at 10 a.m. in the morning. And bo suffered memory loss and thought that she had come to reclaim my fleet. But in actuality, it's no longer your fleet. Simply because she didn't have the right of claim to the Darksaber. Din Djarin does. That means she needed to challenge. Then I challenge you. Dank Farrick, she challenged the wrong guy. But seriously, dude, all it takes is a few credits to buy these people's honor. We probably credits are no good out here. I need something more real. It's <laughs> not even real money. She could have just purchased these losers for nothing. All it takes is a few credits. And of course, bo beat the crap out of the drunken asshole who drinks at 10 a.m. in the morning. As always, bo is too blunt with insufficient amount of working brain cells to be a successful leader. You will never be the true leader of our people. Because she didn't need to beat the crap out of Axe Wolves. It's the one you should be challenged. And as she was about to spill the blood of Axe Wolves, she gave the reason why. Enough Mandalorian blood has been spilled by her own hands. And as her final desperate attempt to retain the honor of these Walmart Mandalorians, she resorted to the Caesar defense. Apes together! Strong! Mandalorians together! Strong! Axe Wolves calling Din a misguided zealot while saying there has not one drop of Mandalorian blood in his veins. His big quarter calling the stifling slimy energy. Which to be fair, not far on par for someone who unironically asserting that the distribution of sword via combat is a proper basis for a system of government. It's an outdated imperialist dogma that perpetuates the economic and social differences in our society. Supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony. Be quiet! 
The two groups of Mandalorians are opposite of one another. These people DeLoreans remove their helmets. You are not Mandalorian. Put stock in ideas on bloodlines and lineages. He's one of them. To determine who gets to be called Mandalorian. Think Ferrick. While the Buckethead people DeLoreans can't even tell what anyone looked like underneath their helmets all the times, let alone determining bloodlines. That means as long as they follow the creed, everyone is equal in this narco-syndicalist commune. We take it in turns to act as a sort of executive officer for the week. Yes. But all the decisions of that officer have to be ratified at a special bi-weekly meeting. Uh, this is the way. Yes, I see. By a civil majority in the case of purely internal affairs. Because we are Mandalorians. Be quiet. But by a two-thirds majority in the case of Mandalorians. Be quiet. I order you to be quiet. I mean, it is an autonomous collective by all means. Meanwhile, the naked skinhead people DeLoreans living in a dictatorship, which is a self-perpetuating autocracy. In which the working classes... Oh, there you go, bringing class into it again. That's what it's all about. Oh, if only people would Please, realize. please, good people. We need to continue the video. Where were we? A misguided zealot possesses the blade. And it is at this very moment that Din Djarin realized, just like his covert, that these Mandalorians are also the common clay of the New West. You know. Morons. And decided to lawyer up. Because Axe Wolves was right about one thing. Bo Katan will not be the true leader of our people. Because she can't take it. This is because Din Djarin was never the rightful claimant of the Darksaber, and Bo Katan of House Creeds really should know. The same as her sister Satine, who successfully ruled Mandalore without the Darksaber. There are plenty of misguided fan speculation on who is the rightful claimant to the Darksaber. Some say Maul was defeated by Papatine, who was defeated by Windu, who was defeated by Anakin who was killed by Vader, another said Maul was beaten by Obi-Wan who was killed by Vader, which is not exactly true since Kenobi timed himself rejoining into the force with the stroke of the lightsaber in order to radicalize Luke into blowing up 1.2 million people. For the sake of the argument, let's say Kenobi was defeated by Vader, who was defeated by Luke, <coughs> making him the rightful claimant to the Darksaber. Another version had Ahsoka beating Maul who got beat by Vader, and then Palpatine beat him, and then Vader beat him again. <coughs> I mean, Luke defeated Vader before he defeated Palpatine, mind you. And then just Ray nobody beat the crap out of Luke, making her the rightful claimant to the Darksaber, forgetting that the Sith Lord Luke Skywalker tried to kill his own apprentice to maintain the rule of two, and as a result almost got himself killed by Ben Solo, who later almost killed just Ray nobody, before Leia stepped in to help Ray kill her only son, giving Ray the right to the Darksaber, before realizing that Ben Solo is her only chance of losing her virginity, and she quickly hit Control Z. But then, by doing exactly what Palpatine asked her to do, kill me, and as the spirit of all the Sith passed into her proved too powerful for her puny body and she died anyway. Until a weebo hanging in cliff decided to perform necromancy for sex. Unfortunately, he only managed to get to second base before running out of mana, condemning Rey for a lifetime of virginity and master of Mandalore. Or so they said. The amount of people trying to fit the Darksaber into the other one rule is too damn high. Here's an exclusive clip from the showrunners to those who argued that the Darksaber rule is like the Elder One. <laughs> Because it isn't. By the Elder One rule, you just have to beat the person. But for the Darksaber, it's not about beating the person. It's about winning the Darksaber. And now I will win it from you. Remember, it must be won in battle. Which by definition means the Darksaber must be present in said battle. Bonus points if you win it by Creed. And Maul realized that he wasn't supposed to use the Darksaber after being defeated by Palpatine. And left it for the Night Sister and Dathomir. His continued usage would have brought about his own ruin. With Mandalore laid to waste and its people scattered to the four winds. But not because Palpatine won the right of claim to the Darksaber against him in battle. I'll explain in a bit. For now, all of this meant that we can see if someone who's wielding the Darksaber actually has their right of claim to it or not by looking at the result of their rule. If Mandalore was laid to waste and its people scattered to the four winds, that meant that they didn't actually have their right to the Darksaber. And the last time Bo-Katan wielded the Darksaber, Mandalore was laid to waste and the people scattered to the four winds. Before her, when Maul wielded the Darksaber, Mandalore was laid to waste and the people scattered to the four winds. Before Maul, Pre Vizsla wielded the Darksaber, resulting in Mandalore laid to waste and the people scattered to the four winds. You're all traitors! So, long before Maul took the Darksaber by Creed in battle, it was Pre Vizsla who challenged Obi-Wan by Creed in battle. Defend her if you will! And lost the claim to the Darksaber. But this doesn't make Obi-Wan the rightful claimant to the Darksaber, for Clan Vizsla never had the right of claim to the Saber to begin with. Recall that this lightsaber was stolen from your Jedi Temple. 
by my ancestors during the fall of the Old Republic. Which means Clan Vizsla never had the right to claim to the Darksaber because it was never won by Creed in battle. Therefore, it meant every single one of those who laid claim to the Darksaber was undeserving. QED. Which is unfortunate, for the Darksaber is a more noble weapon for bo to wield. It is of a quality of Beskar I have never seen before. Because it was forged over a thousand years ago by the Mandalore Tar Vizsla. But recall that Mandalorian steel is meant for armor. Not weapons. Let alone a Jedi weapon. Which means... Mere existence puts Mandalorians at risk. But make no mistake. The Darksaber is a weapon that is made of Baskar. And it's certainly not a giant oversized bread toast slicer. And so, because Clan Vizsla's ancestors stole the Darksaber from the Jedi Temple, and the Darksaber being a weapon made of Baskar, therefore, the very existence of the Darksaber itself is cursed to Mandalorians themselves. And, as long as it exists, Mandalore will be laid in ruins by anyone who who wielded it, resulting in its people scattered to the four winds again and again. It is unavoidable. It is your destiny. Hence, it must be destroyed. Or not, because these Mandalorians delve too greedily and too deep. A misguided zealot possesses the blade. One, I might add, who has not one drop of Mandalorian blood in his veins. But Din Djarin is a martyr with a heart of gold. What a martyr craves more than anything is a sword to fall on. So, you sharpen the blade. The ruler of Mandalore must possess the dark saber. Hold it at just the right angle. You won't even take the dark saber from me. And then three, two, one. Then she shall have it. It's not a gift. And this is why you should never take legal advice from Mandalorians. She defeated the enemy that defeated me. Oh no. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. It must be won. By Creed in battle. Would this blade then not belong to her? Well, Din fell into an ambush and got caught. His Darksaber got looted. It was hardly even a battle, let alone won by Creed. There wasn't a fight to begin with. Would it not belong to her? Absolutely not. It would. Thank Ferrick. I return this blade to its rightful owner. Fine, she did kill that space cockroach. Even then, these people DeLoreans missed something. Because when Din Djarin started his story, he started with... While exploring Mandalore... And they just let it slide without making a peep. The correct reaction should have been... While exploring Mandalore... You gotta be kidding me. Mandalore, the Empire turned that planet to glass. That planet has been ravaged, plundered, and poisoned. But not to these brain-dead Mandalorians. And that's why, when Din Djarin told them that Bo-Katan is the rightful owner of the Darksaber... Would this blade then not belong to her? They believe them. It would. These porkers are far too trusty. And to drill it down to everyone who's watching this, when Din Djarin asked, would this blade then not belong to her? The second time, he turned to the fourth wall at the audience and stared down. Would it not belong to, to her? intimidate you into bending to his wishes, as if saying, we're not leaving this to discussion, you hear me nerds? But us Star Wars fans, we are smarter. <clears throat> Mind tricks don't work on me! Because if they merely give in the blade without proving their warrior prowess, the Darksaber becomes a curse that dooms all of Mandalore. I return this blade to its rightful owner. And so, after Din Djarin's M-Ban face pulls blaster got blew up, and his Beskar spear got turned into a baby diaper, he handed over the only noble weapon to the one person in the galaxy who had wielded it before and failed to do the same job, and expect her to do the same job that she has failed before. And here's to everyone who saw this and said they did a Harry Potter. <laughs> Well, at least Din Djarin still have his blaster. And don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for more exciting content from the Star Wars universe.